kind of to assess where everyone is and then maybe um, mold the tour towards what you guys want to see. Uh, so has I just like some some questions. Who here runs a garden in their in their house at all? Okay. And who here has ever heard of the word permaculture before? Okay. Um, who runs kind of traditional gardens, like uh, you know boxes, veggies, that sort of thing? Oh. And does anyone have any kind of fruit tree hill set up? Okay. okay so. Um, when I, like, I got started in this because I had young kids, uh, the climate crisis was getting a lot of news, and I thought, I don't know anything about this besides the fact that it's, it's apparently a big deal, and there's a lot of scientists that think it's a big deal. And how can I be an engineer in my mid-30s at the time and know nothing about potentially, you know, the, the biggest threat that the human race has ever experienced? Uh, so I started really digging into that. Um, and got a little depressed about it. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to see stuff like the Amazon rainforest on fire for three weeks now, and no one's really doing anything about it. Um, it's hard to hear that we're depositing topsoil into our lakes and rivers, um, where we have Stanford University estimates we have 55 years of topsoil remaining, and no one's doing anything about it. Um, we're at 415 parts per million uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, which is just absolutely absurd. We have five gigatons of methane in the atmosphere. Um, there's a hundred to a thousand gigatons of methane under um, the, the most shallow permafrost shelf that is actively melting today, and it's 50 meters thick. Uh, Greenland is about 1.5 uh, miles thick, and everyone's talking about Greenland, but the East Pacific shelf is. 50 meters thick and it's actively melting. It's got 100 gigatons of methane. If that gets out, it's it's like it's game over. It's done. We're targeting two degrees global warming rise uh, by 2050. Is kind of what we're we're hoping where we can achieve that. And the reason why two degrees is important is because that's when those um, snowball cliff edge effects happen. So you can think of it like a like an egg on a table. Maybe the table's a little rounded and the egg is rolling around the table right now. And we got to get it to the middle of the table and keep it there because everything falls off. If the egg falls off the table, we lose the ability to control it anymore. So that's what the methane is. Methane's 37 times worse than the greenhouse gas than CO2. Right now, we can pull the CO2 out of the atmosphere and cool the planet so we don't melt and release the methane. If we release the methane, it's done. It came over. So, um, this is what kind of got me into um, permaculture. I started seeing permaculture. Permaculture is a design science. Uh, it tries to stack functions on top of each other and work efficiencies in uh, to get um, a system set up and designed using the forest as a feature because the forest is one of the only regenerative ecosystems on the planet. Uh, the forest builds about an inch of topsoil in between 1,000 and 2,000 years. And in the last 150 years, we've eroded about 15 feet of topsoil into the, into the ocean. So we just, we can't keep doing that. Um, and I'll get off my soapbox now, um, but this is why I started to, to get into this stuff. Um, so the goal for my system isn't to maximize peat yield per hectare. It's not to maximize corn yield per hectare. It's to maximize the amount of carbon going into the ground. Um, and it's to maximize the overall uh, life yield uh, per hectare, per, per acre. Um, fruit trees are basically just giant machines. Uh, growing out of thin air, you know, they pull the carbon out of the air, they rip the oxygen off, and they stick it in the, the bodies of the tree and then into uh, sugars called exudates through the root. The exudates are like a carbohydrate sugar snack that feeds the soil microbiology and all life on the earth is carbon. So all the soil microbiology, all the life in the soil is storing the carbon in their bodies just like I am right now walking around. So. In order to get the most amount of carbon in the ground, we should be looking at basically one thing, and that is to every single year uh, maximize the life in the soil. So that's my goal, is my goal is to not worry about what my plants look like this year, but to worry about what my soil looks like next year. So if something is uh, struggling and dying, I don't really care. I'll just plant more and I'll focus on bringing in organic matter, covering my soil, 
um, so that the life in the soil can grow. So in order to maximize that, um, the main things that you want to do is never have bare soil. So two things that nature never does. Nature doesn't do waste. Waste is a human concept. There's n like in nature, nothing's ever wasted. It's just all cycled back in and decomposed. Uh, and the second thing nature doesn't do is bare soil. So if you see bare soil anywhere in nature, something's really wrong. There's, there's toxic, toxic chemicals in the ground that's suppressing uh, weed seeds from germinating. Um, my list of weeds has shrunken. When I started, you know, I might have considered, I, I didn't even know anything. So I knew dandelions were weeds because people told me I have to get it out of my lawn. And I guess Creeping Charlie I heard was a weed. So that was my list of weeds. But then as I got into more gardening, my list of weeds swelled into, I don't know, at the, every plant I, I looked up and I, I looked it up on Plants for a Future, which is a really good uh, website to learn about plants. Uh, so I looked it up and read it and, you know, you'll read on the internet and, oh, that's a weed. You should destroy it. You should, you should eliminate it. Um, my list of weeds now is down to uh, poison ivy, and I shouldn't call that a weed, but I, I hate it, so I call it a weed. Um, and dog strangling vine, because it just strangles everything out. And that's, that's literally my list of weeds. So I have um, a very different garden. I don't pull weeds. It, I, I'll take a photo of it. I'll learn what it is, if it's Queen Anne's lace, as long as I don't have carrots that it can cross-pollinate with. It's a wonderful pollinator attractor. If I have mullein, um, I'll make tea out of it, and I will uh, chop and drop it to build soil, and I'll let it drill its deep taproot down and dredge nutrient and bring it back up to the soil. So uh, pretty much every plant is functional. You just have to learn what the functions are. So uh, my garden, especially the lower garden, it's going to be terrifying for some people. You know, you're going to see like plants and weeds and flowers everywhere. But I tell you, uh, I don't have a problem with pollination here. Um, I don't have a problem with pests, and I used to. Uh, I used to have caudally moss in all my pears. I don't have any now at whatsoever. So when I get a pest pressure, my solution is always plant more stuff. Plant more herbs, plant more uh, uh, beneficial insect attractor. So that's the concept of, of the place. Um, it's roughly a thousand fruit trees um, and um, nitrogen fixing trees and bushes. It's uh, roughly, or yeah, a thousand fruit trees. It's roughly 10,000 bushes and it's roughly a hundred thousand or more flowers because I just get seed and I just throw it over. So um, when I bought the place, the house was kind of run down. Um, the lawn was out to, it was around, actually, you know what? It was around here. So it was around here and it curled in and that was just absolute wild grasses up to here, weed infested pit. There was a poisonous honeysuckle here that was like 25 feet around that I had to dig out and clear. So all of this is in three years. Um, a lot of work, it's just me. I don't have any equipment, just myself, a shovel and a wheelbarrow. Um, a lot of work, a lot of work. Uh, like a thousand trees, and, and I also plant trees other other places. My friend Pierre's got a, a place, and I've done a bunch of trees for him as well. Um, don't tell anybody, but I do a lot of gorilla gardening, so I, I plant a lot of trees and food for deer out in, in nature. I spread uh, asparagus seeds and stuff like that everywhere. Uh, any seed that drops, I, I, I try to capture it and I try to turn it into a tree somewhere. Any saplings. I mean, this is a good example. Um, this peach was the Genesis peach. It was the peach that started it all. So uh, when I decided I wanted to grow food, I planted this peach. This peach was, let's see if I can get, this peach was about this big. As big as this apple here. So it was about that big. So just pencil thickness around. We'll see that when we go. It was half the size of this. It was about this thick. It's one of those branches, <laughs> tiny little things. Um, and that was three years ago. Um, I'm a big proponent. Like I made mistakes with everything. So I have places I want to stop. And uh, I think the biggest thing that I can get across to you is the mistakes that I've made. Because I can tell you everything I did well, and I'm going to look like a genius. Um, but I made more mistakes than I've done things right. Now I have a system where I prep the area I'm going to plant in a year to a year and a half in advance and I have like a little demonstration site there I want to expand that area mm -hmm. I talk about drip edges when I get there mm -hmm. um, so I prep the area in advance 
and the reason is that I got into Dr. Ellie Ingham's stuff and soil microbiology. So, um, last thing I'll say before we go, uh, just so you can kind of understand how I transition into forest versus and how you can get started versus grass, is every system on the planet, when you disturb soil and you have bare soil, nature starts from square one and it'll, it'll move in weeds and weeds are basically tend to be nitrogen fixers so they can get their nitrogen to grow the leaves from the, the atmosphere and then they'll drop their leaves season after season after season and build organic matter in the soil and then you get so basically sandy beach and then you get the most pernicious of the pernicious weeds typically thorny stuff to keep animals out it, it's funny because nature's like nature's got this all on lockdown it, it knows what to do and it the plants that grow in the conditions that they grow best in are for very specific reasons and it's you know, it's not that maybe nature is intelligent per se, but it's just that um, the plants that succeeded the most were the things that did the thing that was the most valuable thing at that time for the ecosystem to grow and for it to reproduce its genetics. So, um, the, typically the plants that come in early are going to be the most pernicious weeds, and they'll block animals from getting out to allow the saplings, like tiny little sapling trees and bushes, to get established, or else the animals are just destroying it. I have deer, and I'll talk about how I fence out, out, like fence out deer and all that sort of stuff here. Um, but you know, they'll take a tree from from this to nothing in you know a couple deer coming. In. So something's got to stop that. The roots do with the big long thorns and the stuff like uh, sea buckthorn here, um, with the just giant like tire flattening like nail thorns. And then uh, woody woody things will come up, bushes. They'll die back, and now they're putting lignans on the ground. The lignans are in the wood. Uh, as soon as lignans are on the ground and a mushroom, a saprophytic mushroom moves in to consume that, it's game over. You're going to old growth forest. If you don't get there, then you'll stay in grassland. So if you get lignans on the wood and you or lignans, woody stuff on the ground, and you get mushrooms moved in, saprophytic mushrooms, which I'll be able to show you a ton of them today because it actually was kind of moist this morning. Is that a good thing? That's mushrooms? a very good thing. Mushrooms are mushrooms are the keystone kingdom on the planet earth they are the thing that keeps it all tied together they transfer nutrients there's been uh, research where um, they put peppers in pots and an insect will come and just destroy the pepper an insect will come and destroy the pepper and then they, they put insects in the ground and the same thing happens and then they put insects and they mulch it with wood chips and as soon as the insect comes from a pepper plant like hundreds of feet away, the pepper is releasing chemicals to attract the predator of the thing that's eating it. Mm -hmm. So the mushrooms are the thing that ties all it together, uh, wrapping itself, uh, like wrapping the mycelium network around the roots, and then it's like a communication network that communicates between plants. Mm -hmm. It balances nutrients, it holds and stores water, it does so many things, like new mushrooms are the, the secret to all of it. So when you're starting out, I don't know this is long-winded, I practice this and I'm like, I can't say all this stuff without it taking an hour, but I'm gonna move on, I promise. When, when you start out, you'll notice like my grass, this grass was just brown and dead. Um, and if it doesn't rain for a while, everywhere around me is brown and dead. But my grass is not a monoculture grass anymore. It's very much a polyculture grass and there's clovers in it everywhere. So I still sowed it out to clovers. So when everyone else's grass is dying, I'm not watering and my grass is staying green because the clovers are, are perfectly happy. The clover is a perfect, you know, a perfect fat broad leaf shape to maximize the shade on the soil. Mm -hmm. The shade on the soil prevents evaporation. It prevents soil microbiology from dying. The soil microbiology can live higher in the soil and deeper as well. Um, more water is held in the soil because there's no cross winds that are evaporating water and wicking it away. Um, we owe all life on the planet to the fact that um, there's an inch of topsoil and it rains. So uh, we should be trying to maximize life in the soil and water in the soil. That's what clover does. So grasses and clovers, they like bacterial dominated soil. And as soon as, like I said, as soon as that first tree grows in a scrubland and drops down and mushrooms move in, it's game over. You're transitioning to old growth forest. Uh, you're, you're now regenerative and you're gonna start building uh, soil life and topsoil. So what we want to do is transition soils from bacterial, the wheat pit, and as it goes to old growth forest, the soil chemistry gets more and more fungal. 
it goes from about 80-20 bacterial to 80-20 fungal in a, a old growth forest. So the way that we do that the, the most is we get wood chips on the ground. Mm -hmm. So wood chips on the ground will like instantly convert uh, the micro, it'll instantly start building that soil microbiology so that when you do plant your tree in, you're not planting your tree in a bacterial dominated soil. It's like throwing a fish in a tree and wondering why it didn't, why it didn't survive. You're throwing a, a tree in a fungal dominated soil that it wants to live in, an environment it wants to go in. It can establish really deep roots. I don't water my trees whatsoever. They don't get a drop of water from me so that they're forced to get the roots out far and deep and they, they can take care of themselves. And if that means half my trees die when I plant them, half the trees die when I plant them. But I can't do this scale and baby my trees. So if I baby my trees early and they don't develop the roots, they don't survive. So it's like raising kids. If you teach, if you do everything for your kids, you shouldn't you know, wonder when they come home from university, they don't know how to do their laundry and they don't know how to pay their bills and they don't know how to manage money, right? So it's the same with trees. You gotta, you gotta get them teaching themselves. So I planted, um, you guys can all come around. Uh, the first year I planted uh, uh, a pear and then a pear and a pear. And it was, it was basically four trees um, in the middle of a grass lawn and I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, then I read that you should mulch the trees so I put a little ring of mulch around each tree about this big because <laughs> right, I heard that was good. So after that I started sheet mulching and then filling in spaces. If there's something I wish I would have done earlier, it's, it's plant way more dense than I did. Um, I've added in and filled in some of, the, some of the spaces, but you can see some of the stuff is very young. So like when I say a thousand trees, this service berry counts as one. Um, stuff like the peach pits that are growing there, I don't count those. Uh, one day I guess I'll count them when I transplant them out. But every peach that gets eaten gets planted. So every single pit gets planted. Um, <coughs> peach trees like to die. It's just the thing that they like to do. So this tree is already already um, there's just a fungal canker that pops the tree out and then the sap falls out. I can't really do anything here. It's kind of remarkable that I can even grow peaches here. They're more of like a zone six thing. Um, just a very cold hardy variety, so I'm big on picking the right varieties. Um, but I know this tree's got maybe a couple years left in it, so I'm already trying to grow its successors in and around it. And then hopefully one of those takes off, and as this one dies, there's just another tree that's there ready to take its place. So I, I try to do that everywhere. So in this strip, um, there's probably roughly 50 to 125 trees planted in here. I know it doesn't look like it, but this, there's tiny little trees everywhere. So you're not concerned that it gets too overcrowded no. at one point? No, so basically when there's a, what's the guy, uh, Bob Welsh Nursery in Florida, he does these trials with uh, like uh, multi-hole uh, fruit trees. He'll put four apple trees in a hole. Um, and basically the idea is that he'll, he'll do um, non-dwarf root stock. So he'll do full-size root stock and then plant them um, densely and basically when you do that the trees when their canopies touch the, the hormones in the in the branches kind of change and it says okay I'm about to compete with something else so it, fo it kind of focuses more on fruiting and less mm. on growing branches because it knows that it's not going to get a lot of value out of the branches so when you plant densely with full-grown rootstock the, the, the system balances itself if you plant closely with a bunch of dwarf rootstock they don't get what they need and they all die. So mm -hmm. it's it's all about doing it, um, like knowing how the plants work and then and then try to maximize density. So the reason why a food forest has the most amount of carbon sequestration is that when we grow rows of corn, um, all the corn is the same height over you know a whole entire field. The roots are, even more importantly, the roots are the same depth. So the soil microbiology Will, uh, it needs to eat and it eats the exudates that the roots put out. So when the when the roots are only this shallow, that's where the soil life is. So you need a bunch of different plants in all your guilds. So you need a deep taproot and nutrient accumulator to dredge nutrients up. You need plant, uh, roots that drive deep taproots, uh, trees that do deep taproots, trees that have shallow taproots. Same with bushes, and you want to fill in all the 3D spaces so that you're capturing the most amount of photosynthesis energy, which is transferring the most amount of carbon into the soil, 
my, uh, magnifying the soil microbiology that's supporting the whole system. So if I planted this in the middle of my lawn, for example, um, everything would die. Nothing would live. So if you started doing this in your backyard, you'd be done. But if you work for a year to kind of set it up and you slowly add things in and the system tightens up and evolves, then you can support an incredible diversity of plants. And if you look at, um, I just even look behind here, the wilder spaces, these are coppice sumacs that are behind you and they go all the way down the hill. Um, I don't count these as my trees either, um, but this is what nature does. Nature plants trees two to three inches apart and the whole system is healthy. Nature doesn't put fruit trees in an orchard 25 feet apart with grass in between it. So nature can support a lot more than we think it is, but you got to maximize this photosynthesis capture and the water capture. And the water capture, the big thing is uh, wood chips. So we'll start uh, moving a little faster, showing around. And then um, if there's a desire at the end, uh, I can talk about individual plants if you want that are planted. If you have any questions, just ask. Um, everything here is edible. Um, absolutely every plant that are planted in the, you know, the wood chipped passes either edible medicine or, or fuel but if it's fuel it's also edible or medicine as well and if it's medicine it's also edible so I know that I can eat anything that's in here at, at least at the very least there's nothing poisonous in here um, so this is like an example of a guild uh, yeah I think this is a decent one so here's an example of a guild it's a, a pear tree whenever I put in a tree I try to add in nitrogen fixing with it so this is a sea buckthorn, it's a nitrogen fixer. Um, I picked these up close to where you guys met today. Um, there's a abandoned lows there and these things are full of air. Um, I have like a 95-5 rule. So if I'm gonna harvest something out of nature and transplant it to my lot, I leave 95% of it always in nature. So there's a lot of this out there. I took just tiny little bits of it and they were small when I took them as well. Um, these are rhizome spreaders, so I just try to put them wherever I'm going to mow for the most part, or I don't mind them spreading uh, because they'll spread rhizomely. Mm -hmm. These are on the in invasive list, um, which I have a massive issue with because um, these are invasive because they're nitrogen fixers. They grow really well in damaged, destroyed soil. Our planet is damaged and destroyed, uh, mm -hmm. so they do really well because we've killed our planet. Um, when these get shaded out, they instantly die. So when they've done their job and built the soil up, they uh, graciously pa pass away and lead to the next level of a uh, plant. So I think it's awful that stuff like this is labeled as invasive. Um, this berry is the healthiest berry on the planet, arguably. You could say gojis are kind of close, but the nutrient composition inside a sea buckthorn berry is mm -hmm. like off the charts. You can't touch it. It's in um, creams and uh, you know uh, health medicine and vitamins and all this sort of stuff. Romans used it thousands of years ago to feed to their horses and their horses had beautiful hair. So <laughs> it's got anti-aging properties, it's got, uh, it, it, it's just, it, it, it does so many different things. It's a very healthy berry. It, it tastes like medicine. So it tastes like Buckley's. <laughs> it tastes like medicine because it is medicine. Um, so I always put uh, nitrogen fixers in with other trees. Um, nitrogen fixer is the thing that people mess up with. So the reason you put a nitrogen fixer in the tree, uh, in the area, is because I, I throw a ton of carbon down on the ground. So I throw a ton of carbon down on the ground. If I want that to break down, I need to add nitrogen. So a typical ratio is four parts by volume carbon, uh, one part by volume nitrogen. By molecular weight, it's something like 40 to 1 more carbon than nitrogen. So that's when you're composting, the decomposition process, all that. Um, so I need nitrogen getting into the soil, and the way that I get that is just leaf litter has some. Uh, when the leaves dry out, it becomes more carbon because the nitrogen off gas is into the air. Um, but um, when they're fresh and they fall down and they're allowed to decompose on the ground, then it's, it's a lot of nitrogen. Um, and then these, specifically, um, there's a uh, mycorrhizal bacteria, which is like a root bacteria. Um, let me dig up a clover. I also plant clover. So, maybe 
maybe I'm ripping them all off. <laughs> you know what? I'll get the clover down near the 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 uh, river system that I have going. If this doesn't have it, there's a nitrogen fixing bacteria in the root that makes these little nitrogen nodules. So you can see some of them there. Pass that around. See these little nodules? Oh, yeah, little bumps. You can pass that around. Like little bumps. They're these little hard little capsules. Um, and what it is is it's, it's crystallized nitrogen in the form of the bacteria. So the bacteria, it's actually the crystallized dead bacteria that then end up getting like glomulated together and make these nitrogen crystals. So when, um, when plants get cut, all plants, all plants maintain a above ground uh, balance of mass with below ground root mass. So when I just did that to my comfrey plant, it's gonna respond two ways. It's gonna to try to regrow um, more leaves and it's also gonna shed back some of the roots. All plants will do this. So when you prune your fruit trees, it'll do this as well. And then in that shed back, it actually creates, uh, like it'll die back the roots and it actually creates a new junction point where the roots will actually fragment off. So it actually ends up over time with a more healthy root system. Um, specifically when you do that to a nitrogen fixer, those clusters of nitrogen get disassociated from the root. If you don't disassociate it from the root, it just serves the plant, the host plant. If you disassociate it from the root, it's now a nitrogen capsule inside the soil that feeds everything around it. So when I plant um, nitrogen fixers next to fruit trees, it's not just good enough to plant it. What you have to do then is come by and aggressively prune these. Now, um, most nitrogen fixers are very, they coppice really well. So coppice is, if I cut it at ankle height, um, and I can show it in different spots, if I cut it at ankle height, it'll respond with a bunch of growth and it'll turn kind of into a bush and it'll do bushy aggressive growth, vegetative growth. Most um, nitrogen fixers respond really well to that. So when I cut this back, this is a sacrificial tree to feed the whole system. So as, as I cut this back, um, it'll just flush out nitrogen, not in, not in pulses, but it'll flush out a bunch of nitrogen capsules that'll then get slow release into the, the soil. So nitrogen fixer is really good. One of my favorite nitrogen fixers is clover. I've bought more bags of clover seed than I care to admit. I spread it out, and as I'm spreading it out, I have birds landing in my hand eating the clover seed. So it's just, my wife calls me Disney princess sometimes. <laughs> uh, so um, it's part of my bunny defense as well which I can talk about um, when we get to like an area where the bunny pressure is really bad. Um, when bunnies graze the clover, first they love the clover, so then clover. they'll preferentially eat the clover. But there's clover everywhere. You look down and there's clover, I guarantee it. I don't care where you are in my property. There's clover everywhere. Your guys are all standing on clover. That is all clover. So when the bunnies come and, what, like say when I mow, because I have a tour coming through, uh, all the clover gets released into the food forest. Um, when bunnies come and graze it, they, they love the clover so they eat that and they don't grow my, my fruit trees. Um, they eat that so they don't eat my tomatoes, they eat that and they don't eat my lettuce. Well, they eat some of the lettuces. I plant too close to them. Um, but even those lettuces then defend against the fruit trees. Um, so I don't fence my bunnies out. I actually kind of invite them in. I want them to come in because they eat the clover. They trigger that um, disassociation of the root nodules and then they flush and feed the system, and then they manure right next to my garden. Um, so in doing that, I turn like my worst foe into kind of my greatest source of fertility. So I have hundreds of rabbits. We just saw one actually, Liz and I in, uh, in Hawaii just saw one uh, earlier, uh, maybe an hour or so ago. They're all in here. So what I like to do with the clover is, um, using my strawberries for example, <coughs> So the strawberries started out as like four strawberries, uh, and it, it, I just keep, you know, planting the runners. I've spread mm -hmm. these all throughout my my system, so now I'm getting. I think the four strawberries cost me 20 bucks, and ever like I, I dug up, I had to be 500 strawberries this year and planted them everywhere. So that's just it's like printing money. Mm -hmm. um, my kids love the strawberries, actually. Like 
Like they're just, they're unbelievable. They're so tasty. Let me try one. Mm. These are the Everbearing ones? Yeah, so these are, these are Everbearing. I have Everbearing and what's the other one called? Junebearing or? Yeah. Um, so I have, I have mm. both here, but the Everbearing runnered really well. So they ended up strangling out the other one. Yummy. Yeah. So yeah, you can see they're flowering again. We were pulling off this patch here. We were pulling 20 cups of strawberries every day for two weeks. Our freezer's full of frozen strawberries. We made more jam than I care to admit. Um, so what I really do want out of this tour is people to say, okay, well, maybe I can't do it on that scale, um, but I like this. I like this mm -hmm. little area. Maybe I can do this in my front lawn. Maybe I can do this against the fence in my backyard, something like that, right? Um, I always plant in polyculture, so even though this looks like a big patch of strawberries, uh, there's has caps, there's elderberries, there was rows of garlic and onions here. You can see some of the onions here. These are Egyptian walking onions, they're perennial. So they put these bulbs on the top, which then you can disassociate and plant in the ground. You don't even really have to plant them, you can just kind of work them in. I have those everywhere now. I bought two of, like you can see them kind of behind in the peach behind the peach there. I bought like two or three of them and they put out, each one puts out like eight bulbs. And they're prolific. Yeah, they're so <laughs> prolific, they're great. Um, they don't get too big, but the greens are really good in soups. Um, the little bulbits are uh, pretty good. They're like a milder flavor and then the actual bulb is pretty pretty big. So I always plant in, in polycultures, you know, like a, like has caps, there's asparagus there, there's another sea buckthorn, there's more garlic. I even have tomatoes growing up the peach tree. Um, there's raspberries in there. <coughs> this was walls of uh, onion and garlic. There's comfrey here that I chop and drop. Um, mullein, like, yeah, you can, I, I got lots for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> mullein, I make sure I let mullein go to seed, uh, help it out. This is a deep tap rooter, just like comfrey. Um, it, it makes a great tea. I love mullein because it wants to come up everywhere. Uh, it's got a beautiful flower. People will see it and go like, oh my god, he's got weeds everywhere, but it's a really handy, useful plant. Um, there's like elderberry. I had a persimmon here. I moved it to a microclimate I created for it because uh, it kept dying back every year. And then uh, I have it down near a stream, like wetland ecosystem I'm trying to create in the back. And then uh, I have like pears. I have pears and service berries. Another thing I do is um, I make my own biochar, so in terms of putting carbon back in the soil, you can't do better than charcoal. Charcoal is how nature does it, so nature brings lightning down on forests and starts forest fires and then puts charcoal down. So I make my own biochar with all my tree uh, pruning. I prune the trees, I set them up as uh, animal habitat around uh, in like little piles. They'll dry out there and they'll function as like a bunny habitat or something as well in the meantime. And then I'll turn it into charcoal. Uh, the charcoal then goes in my compost system. So the biochar is like, uh, it's got a bunch of activation nucleation bonding sites for nutrient and water. Soils amended with charcoal and mulch can hold 100,000 times more water than bare soils. So it's how when, when rain falls, I capture every single drop of rain and store it in the soil and not on the soil so it doesn't wash away. It's a fairly small swale, um, but maybe I'll... Does everyone know what a swale is? Okay, well, let me explain what a swale is. Okay, so maybe come on, come on up here. Look at your tail. Yeah, so this is my bunny defense. I get bunnies coming in from here. Um, and like, you know, I plant oak trees and stuff that I want to get up, so I need to give the bunny something to eat. So I'll put root suckers from tomatoes in that end up growing into tomato plants to give something better than just throwing them on the ground. So I'll just bury them. Um, I want all, this, all these trees to grow. Uh, this is a linden tree. It's like a really good bee attractor tree. So. Um, you want to put pollinator tractors at the entrance to wherever you have so that the bees get attracted and they say like, you know, they're going from cedar monoculture where there's no food for them and then they come and they find their favorite tree and then they go, holy crap, right? <laughs> <laughs> so then they set hives up and honeybees make hives in the ground. They like making hives in wood chips. So they set hives up and then now 
you know, early season, uh, I get daffodils coming up, right? One of the, some of the first flowers. So early season, I tell the bees, this is where you want to set your hives up. And then they come through. And I'll set the he's got a tree here. Um, okay, so a swale. So a swale is a water capture system. Like I said, um, the two goals for creating a regenerative ecosystem that, that takes care of itself is you want to maximize life in the soil and you want to maximize water in the soil. Swales are how we do the water thing. So what a swale is, is anywhere you have contour, uh, like a hill, and everywhere, everywhere feeds, you know, rainfall on the flattest field goes into rivers and oceans. So you can have a flat field, but it's, it's flat, but it's not level. So there's almost no level area uh, in the world, and if it's level in a basin, it's going to be a pond. It's going to, it'll, it'll fill and it'll drain. It'll be a pond. So you can put a swell pretty much anywhere, even if your backyard's flat. You can put a swell. You just have to find out the contour. So what I do is I take, uh, I take two posts and I put a tube connecting the two posts, and I fill it with water. I fill the tube with water, and then I, I mark it, and wherever. I put one, say, post here, and then I'll walk it 10 feet, and I'll move it up the hill, down the hill, wherever the indications on the water are the same, um, that's perfectly level. So I mark it, and I do that right across the hill. And then what I do is I, I dig the soil out, and I put it on the downhill side. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a raised bed on the downhill side, and a trench on perfect contour on the uphill side. So when rain falls, it hits my lawn and then starts to move across my lawn. Even if it's going underwater, it hits this swale. And then instead of running down the hill where I lose it forever, it hits the swale and it fills up with water and it'll spread it right along the fruit huh. trees. And then in the berm side, the hillside, you plant fruit trees. So this is a raised bed now that every rain event will store and hold water and the fruit trees can set their roots at whatever depth they want. So there'll be a moisture gradient of very wet to perfectly dry. If a tree likes really dry systems, it'll have shallow roots. If it likes wet, it'll drive deeper roots to get at that water. So in this way, it's an automatic, passive, um, nature sorting itself out, um, balanced mechanism. So I all, so that's the swale. The swale is a water capture, storing, holding system. Um, what I do with it as well is on the uphill side, I do my final run of the compost. So the compost starts in um, black bins at the other end, uh, where it looks like food scraps and raccoons will get into it, that sort of stuff. Once it's, uh, and I turn it every day, I maintain the ratio for one. Um, I have a pond right next to it so I can adjust the water. As soon as it's done there, then it comes and lives here for about three months where the fungal um, component will build up. It's open to atmosphere here. Um, and this way, because it's open to atmosphere, the risk is that when it rains, the rains will leach the compost nutrients out, which is normally a bad thing. You want to cover the compost pile. The thing is, I want to keep it aerobic because I want to create CO2. I don't want to create methane. Methane is 37 times worse. So I want to maximize how much CO2 I produce. You know, not maximize, but compared to methane. I don't want to turn into methane. Um, so I want to leave it open and then I want to capture the, the nutrient runoff. So now every single rain event is hitting my compost pile, it's leaching the nutrient, it hits the swale, and it spreads the nutrient out in the swale. So every single time it rains, it's a passive automatic fertigation event. So I'm getting fertility automatically for the compost tube. So um, all the plants on this hill are actually doing relatively well considering that they're on a hill, they're in raised beds on the hill. Um, I don't baby them. They came root bound in pots and now they're kind of sorting themselves out. Huh. And it didn't rain for, I think it was 43 days this summer in a row here. Like you, when you, you remember there was that big rainstorm in Durham region, it was pouring in Durham region. I was so happy and I got home, everything was bone dry. It just passed northern. So we had to wait for the next one. So it was like 40 something days and Everything was struggling, but everything did live because I'm, I'm storing and holding so much water in this soil. You know, I don't water whatsoever. So my idea with this is that it's going to be a pathway when it's dry, and then I have blueberries planted on the uphill side. You know, intense polyculture on the downhill side. 
Uh, there's a lot of um, asparagus in the downhill side that I planted. Uh, we made a ton of asparagus and mushroom soup. It's really good. Partly because it's further from the house, so if I'm going to be working, I want to get the house looking nice. So I'll flesh this guild out a little more in the future, but um, the other reason is that this is just going to naturally thick it on its own. Um, and so they're, they're, they'll thick it, and then they, when they reach the forest edge and they get sun, that's when they'll fruit. So here's kind of a, um, a good microclimate for winter because this is south right here, and this is north. So from the cold north winds, nothing's coming down here. It's sunken down where the airflow will actually get up over the trees and continue over, and it stays actually fairly warm down here, you know, relatively. I want to line this with big like thermal mass like rocks. I want to get water down here. I want to put a big pond right in there. You know, there's just, I have like a thousand things I want to do. Um, but then thick mulch is always good. So thick mulch will help it kind of survive. But this thing lives through minus 50 and it, they say it dies at minus 10. And not only that, they all live. So all four of them live. Um, Pawpaws are really good for um, black walnut. So all juglone uh, species have a jugland species. They re exude a chemical called juglone. That's an allopathic chemical. Suppresses the growth of stuff around it. Um, pawpaws actually, uh, I read some research that they actually like it. Um, maybe because there's not as much competition and therefore they thrive and it doesn't impact them. But uh, so this is kind of going to end up being a juglans guild. So butternut, bartnut, walnut will grow here. Uh, black hat raspberry are also planted in here and they like juglone apparently as well. So when I get your um, black walnut trees, Liz, they'll come in here and flush the skill down. Yeah. I yeah. thought they were butternut at first. Butternut, oh. But they're not. Oh. Yeah, we were doing Butternut's supposed to be So these are like, you know, some of my failings here. Uh, this is onion. You should never let an onion go to seed because as soon as it goes to genetics, the onion is using its bulbs energy to push out genetics. So if you ever see onions um, seeding, then you, then you should, yeah, I cut off the seed heads and maybe wait and see, uh, or you can just pick them right there and, you know, that sort of thing. I like to use those though when they, like the, especially with garlic too. It's like green onion, garlic, it's like green onions first thing in the That's spring. Right. It's nothing else coming up and yeah. you've got all these little garlic. You pull them out and eat them. Right. Make, make stuff with them. Yeah, oh, yeah. God. Nothing else is ready by that. Yeah. So this is comfrey. I, you might have seen this. I have this everywhere. So uh, comfrey has the deepest taproot of any herbaceous layer plant on the planet. And it grows locally to us. So deep taproots are important because if you're planting densely, then you want as little competition in the root zone of the trees as you can get. Um, Comfrey's been known to put down 150 foot deep tap roots. Like, so it, when this thing, the problem with that is it's also, it'll grow off of a root fragment, the smallest root fragment. So when you put it somewhere, it's gonna exist there for the, like the rest of eternity. You, you will never get, even if you bring in an excavator, you're not gonna get rid of it. Um, the good thing with that is when, it, when a tree puts down a certain level of roots in the ground, you know, it can access the nutrients in that subsoil layer. When comfrey drives a tap root down 50 feet and gets nutrient from down there where nothing else is getting it, where it's just sinking down to the surface, the center of the earth, it brings it up and it makes leaves. And then I come by, and don't do that, I come by and cut it and chop it and I drop it. Now, I just probably made Three comfrey plants right there. <laughs> so you can see where I've done that before, and I get like this was one plant, but now it's two plants. So at some point I dug something out there. Um, it grows very, very well. I usually use like a little rice knife, and whenever I come down planting trees, that's just that's just what I do. I come down and I chop it and I drop it. And that's it, and that all turns to food for the soil, and it shades the soil life, and it builds soil. So this is one of the most valuable plants. As I do that, the tree's going to respond with vigorous growth. It's going to die back some of its roots. The roots then feed the soil microbiology that's going to eat it. And then on top of the soil, it builds soil. So I'm constantly chopping and dropping, chopping and dropping, adding organic material to the, to the soil. So you can also see, like, I have tent caterpillars 
for example. Um, my, my, I'm doing a lot of talking. I, I should. I was planning on spreading this out more, but when I hit something, I kind of want to talk about it. Um, if you remove your pests, so as soon as we take the role of, of, of managing something, we're signing up for that for life. So if I remove the pests, like these have natural predators. Um, green lacewings like eating them, ladybugs like eating them. If I remove the food source of the green lacewings and ladybugs, how can I ever hope to have a native population of green lacewings and ladybugs? If I could sit down with the smartest people on the planet and, and sabotage green lacewings and ladybugs, I would systematically remove their food source. So what people do is they'll get acids on a plant and they'll kill the plant, they'll harvest it out and they'll do it again, and they'll do it again, and then they get fed up and they spray it and then they get fed up and they say I heard ladybugs like aphids and they buy ladybugs from a store and release them in the garden and the ladybugs go oh I'm free and they take off <laughs> right because there's nothing for them to eat you removed it all so if you want to have an integrated pest management system part of that is you have to have the food for the predators that you're trying to attract so I get pet caterpillars but the tree is handling it and because I leave food up for the ladybugs when they Tent caterpillars walking on the leaves, the birds have to leave. Now I have birds in my system and I have ladybugs and wasps lay eggs in the caterpillars and they explode out of their back like Riley Scott's like greatest dream. And <laughs> <laughs> so like there's some weird things in nature, but I think the solution is always to just remove the human out of the system and then let nature sort it out. So like this was this was an oak that didn't live. I, I plant lots of stuff, lots of it dies. Uh, that one's doing fine. There's concrete, we plant it all in here. This oak's doing all right, it should live. Um, normally I would transition this, like I would mulch it with wood chips. This is not how trees want to live. Um, but like I, I only have so much time, so I just want to get trees in the ground growing. <laughs> So this here is my first attempt at composting <laughs> and you can see how it's gone. So lesson learned, this is a, a mistake that I made getting set up, is I decided I wanted compost. I wanted it far from the house so it didn't smell because when I composted before I didn't know what I was doing. It went anaerobic and it got disgusting and, and smelly. I've now learned to compost and when you do it properly it actually absorbs odors. It actually does not smell whatsoever. So I put compost down here away from the house, but what I realized is my compost is very far from the house now, and I don't come down here and I don't turn it, and uh, it turns into this. I, I mean, this is very overgrown now. Um, but then also in the winter time, like, are you gonna like, you gonna put your snowshoes on and come down here in the winter? So then, what do you do with your compost in the winter? So I'm a lot better at now putting things you know, as close as possible to where I'm going to end up using them. So now my compost is right near the house. It ends up going on a swale that's fairly close to the house where I turn it across. It's feeding fruit trees and I um, integrate versus segregate is like a big concept in, in permaculture. I started out when I was doing all this, creating pathways and segregating everything in their own little spots when I should have actually been looking to integrate it all together and stack efficiencies on top of themselves. So this is a, you know, witnessing like a graveyard of my mistakes. <laughs> so this is maybe the closest you'll get to poison ivy, so just watch on the edges here. Everyone hear that? There's just some poison ivy on the edges here, just have a look. Stay in the middle, single file. <laughs>
Um, we need to plant more trees, right? There, it's estimated we have to plant roughly a trillion more trees on the planet. Um, the Amazon's burning, like right now, it's actually actively burning. Just heads up. There's a point that I hit right now. Yeah, don't hit it. Um, like the Amazon's actively burning right now. Um, Bolivia's sending a big water jet. Hopefully that helps. Um, trees are the, you know, trees are pulling the carbon and putting it in the soil. Um, and we got to plant more trees. The problem is, is that what we do is we cut down forests to make pasture and build homes. And then we replant trees and we think we're doing a good job, but we replant timber and we don't, we don't replant food. So this is what happens when, um, when humans come and destroy an ecosystem and then plant a bunch of cedar trees and say, hey, I did a good job. You get a cedar monoculture. There's no food here for anything. There's absolutely nothing here. It's a dead ecosystem. It looks nice, like it's beautiful, I love it. Um, it looks nice, but it's, it's functionally worthless. So it, there's a big difference between reforesting the planet by planting trees and reforesting the planet by creating an ecosystem that multiplies food. Like if I dig into the soil here, it's just dead. There's nothing in the soil. There's no food for deer. There's no food for anything. So what I do in these areas, I get deer. There's a stream there. I get deer coming up here. Um, so uh, what I do is kind of plant food for the deer down in the wilder areas so that hopefully they stay down there uh, and they have all the food they need down there. And then typically as it comes further up, they're hitting this and they're like, oh, okay, there's nothing here for me. So they stay down there. Um, doesn't work perfectly, but it works pretty good considering how much deer I have. Um, but I just wanted to like sit and, and just look at how beautiful this is, but it, it's dead. Um, so what I'm doing, you can see cutting down some cedars and I'm making posts and pergolas for my stuff out of the cedar. And then I'm going to start, like I've already started planting oaks and maples around here. I'm going to plant less like apples, pears, peaches, and more like uh, acorns and um, protein in the form of nuts for squirrels to then spread out into the wilder areas, put the squirrels to work. Um, and then the other thing I do is I have some wild apple trees down there. So on the way into work, I'll look in February and March for wild apple trees that are still have like fermented, disgusting fruit on them. Um, and then I'll cut cyanwood off that and graft them to my wild apple trees. So then that way the deer in their time of most need have some food. It's like fermented and they'll get drunk and they'd be like a wolf will get them because they'll be drunk. Um, but at least they'll have some food, right? And then they won't come up and when they're, when they're coming up and they're going through this and they haven't eaten in weeks and then they come and they see my fruit trees and all my baby trees, they go, om, nom, nom, and they take it all down. So if I can get food growing on trees in like February, March, then it's good. So, and then those will start dropping apples and then their seedlings will also kind of have that late fruit holding um, capability. There's a guy, Ben Falk, who does that. I got that. It's not my idea. I got it off him. Forest on contour again. The idea here is that when it rains on my land, I want to capture all the, the water that wants to flow away from my property. I want to capture, hold it, and store it. So I, I build these on contour. Um, I would like to kind of put something here with bridges across it so that I don't lose it around the edge of this bed, but I, it still works pretty good. Um, and this is all systems so that you don't have to water and irrigate as much. Um, the other thing, I, the reason I stopped here is I want to talk about how I protect against deer. So uh, this is my main deer entry point. Uh, like I have, I'll show that in a sec. Um, so I have uh, fruit trees all on this area and they kept getting nailed by deer all the time. <laughs> And I, we see deer up here all the time. So what I did was uh, plant a bunch of wild raspberries. So I wanted thorned raspberries. And deer will leap over a six foot fence, but they won't leap into a 12, 15 foot wide swath of raspberries. So what I do is we have tons of raspberries, wild ones that I left up and other really thorny ones that I snuck in there as well. And then we have sumacs that I coppice. So you can see, I don't know if you guys know what sumac looks like, that little guy with, that has the alternate leaves down it, that's a sumac. So when I coppice the sumacs, they grow up really fast with vegetative growth and the deer like that. And then there's also Jerusalem artichokes. So I always try to provide food for them and then I try to make it prohibitive, prohibitively painful for them to push in further. Um, and then hopefully they eat that stuff and they don't push in further. Now, it's not to say they don't just walk up this path, they do, but I, I mean, short of, you know, building a, 
uh, fortress. I can't. That's about as good as I can do. And then um, I really try to. Now that I have, so these are hazelnuts. Um, I guess I can talk about some of the stuff. There's like raspberries and hazelnuts. More of those uh, perennial onions. I have lamb's quarters. This has more protein than fish by weight. Um, it's a weed. People will say it's a weed. It's absolutely delicious. It's really good. It's one of the few weeds that is actually good as just like its own salad. I make weed soups. People at work laugh at me. I come with this green soup and I say it's my weed soup. Um, like so I, you know, purslane, curly dock, lamb's quarters. Lots of good, just wild plants that want to grow that are very, very edible and nutritious. This is one of the most nutritious weeds you, you can have. It's a very prolific seeder. So if anyone, I don't know if these seeds are viable yet. I don't think so. It would be dark and brown. But if you see this coming up, like maybe take a, take a photo of it. Um, it's, it's really good. It's very, very good. It's a nice mild flavor. Uh, so this bed here, um, I'll talk about how I make my beds, but it is uh, compost, cardboard, uh, horse manure, and then um, th I did this shredded leaves because I had 2,000 bags of leaves <laughs> I had to deal with. I would normally do um, wood chips on top of that. It's very bacterial dominated right now, which is why I'm planting a bunch of green leafy veg stuff. Typically, if something's very bacterial dominated like compost, manure, um, Anything leafy green, soft stem is going to do really well. As it turns more fungal, which I had fungus, I had some awesome little guys. They might all be down. Move in there, Sunny. And stuff like tomatoes will do really well, typically. And then I want to up my wildflower game. So this is where, you know, I'll just broadcast wildflowers. Now for pollinators to kind of come in and add some color to the landscape. Mm -hmm. You know, when you start a food forest, you're like, I need, I need fruit right now. So you, you get a bunch of pears and peaches and cherries right here. Um, and you can see I have the, you know, the nitrogen fixing um, yep. sea berries as well. So you, you plant all that and then you end up realizing, okay, I have to plant um, <clears throat> stuff like anise hyssop. 